I was, I, I prefer giving um, a, con um, a talk in a conversational way. And the reason for that is um, so that I tell a story instead of giving you facts and figures. Um, and so today um, I have 30 minutes. In fact, let me just set my timer so that I'm on time. And I will basically tell you the story of FinTech from the beginning to where we are today and where we are going. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank Strathmore Business School for inviting me. Um, for me, this is an honor. I, I always tell people I grew up in Strathmore Business School. I did the owner-manager program in 2012. And um, the difference between the Kevin who entered in January and the Kevin who left was a big change. I dressed different. I talked different. I thought in dollars. Panjiko makes fun of me all the time. Um, and that transformation for me was life-changing. Um, on the panel, I'd also like to thank the panelists, um, Kamau, uh, Rose, Wanjiko, and Devine. Um, people like Kamau and Rose, we started in the industry a long time ago together. Some of them were a little bit ahead of me, and I'll tell you parts of their story, and you see the integral pieces and parts they played in making the financial fintech space what it is today. And so I hope when we get to the Q&A session, um, you ask them tough questions about now, but also then. Um, what is fintech? Before I start what is fintech, um, I like planting a seed in the audience I'm speaking to. And it's, it's a pleasure when you hear the dean speaking about the transformation of the continent and, of course, Kenya. Um, and the seed I'd like to plant is one of that positive sum game. Let us build a bigger pie that we shall share rather than focusing on the small pie that we have today. And the way you do that is by having a shared objective and being a digital financial services person. The shared objective um, that we should all have is making Kenya the global digital financial services hub of uh, not just the region, but globally. That way, individually, we get wealthier. As a society, we get wealthier. And of course, we all do better. So what is fintech? Fintech is also known as digital financial services, tech fin, technology financial services. And those words are interchangeable. And the, the main way to describe fintech is Anything that was done in the traditional way in financial services is now being done on a digital platform. What do I mean? In the old days, you'd go into a bank, you'd fill in a form, they would do KYC verification by looking at you, um, and they would basically put money in your account to give you the loan. Today, all that happens on a smartphone. It, you don't need to go to a place, you don't need to fill in a form, and you don't have to wait for money to be sent to you either in cash or into your bank account. It comes direct into your mobile money wallet. But where did this journey began? begin? Sorry. And I like to start from the beginning so that you get the context and the nuance. I believe the, the third greatest invention in the history of humankind was money, which is where this all began. What money did is it made capitalism more efficient because you could exchange value and store value in a more efficient way. Let me give you an example. If Brian Dempsey here had cabbages that he had farmed in his farm and he wanted to exchange some of those cabbages for protein like meat, before the invention of money, you'd have to find somebody who has meat to offer and they would have to do an evaluation of how much meat equals how many cabbages, and they would exchange. And you can see from that transaction how inefficient that is, because Brian would have to find someone who has meat to offer. Today, with money, what you need is somebody who wants the cabbages. You exchange value at that point. And then you take and store your value using the money and go to look for somebody who has meat and then you exchange it for the meat. And so that's the first, the beginning. 
The second uh, point is what I think is the second greatest invention in the human in our human history, which is debt. And I know people don't like that word debt, and they don't like loans. But debt is basically future value being captured now to create value. In simple terms, it gave the creators and the innovators an opportunity to start building and creating value before they had to accumulate value of their own. So it sped up the process of value creation, right? Now we fast forward, we're now in Kenya. It's 2007 and then PESA is rolled out in Kenya. And what M-Pesa did, it allowed us to move small ticket value, small value tickets to each other and to vendors in a very cheap and affordable way. If you remember before M-Pesa, it used to cost about 900 shillings to do a bank transfer. As a result, you would not want to send 10,000 shillings or 5,000 shillings. You'd go to tea room, I used to go to tea room, give the driver who goes to my, my Shosho's village, my grandmother's village, the 5,000, and then it would get to the other side through the driver. And Pesa sold for that, right? Then comes 2011, which the greatest invention now comes into play, which is digital lending. And many people might argue with me, but if you really think about digital lending, it's a revolutionary thing because I've been a lender for over 17 years. And when we used to lend back in the day, it would cost us at minimum, minimum 7,500 shillings to lend out any amount of money because there was the cost of verification of the, the human being. There was the, the actual admin cost of all the different documents you had to place, the legal fees, blah, blah, blah. And that meant that it was impossible to give small ticket loans. It was impossible to lend 2,000 shillings. No one would take a loan of 2,000 and pay an application fee of 7,500, right? And so the reason it, I, I, I genuinely think it's the greatest invention in humankind, in our human history, is that we now are able to lend as little as 500 shillings, and it cost us shillings to do everything that is necessary to determine if you can give the loan or not. There are three things that we look for when we're lending as lenders. The first is fraud. You want to know, will you get your money back? Right? Right or wrong? Right? The second thing is you want to have an idea if the customer can repay the loan. So it's called ability to repay. So you're looking at transactional data to determine can James or John or Susan pay this loan back if we give it to them based off the cash flows we can see. And so in the old days, you gave your bank statements. Today, we use M-Pesa statements. And digital lending figured out how to scrape SMSs from your phone, delete the text, look at only M-Pesa messages, create a ledger in our back-end system, and determine if you're eligible to get a loan for as little as 500 shillings. And then the third risk is willingness to repay. Now, this is the biggest risk in lending for a first-time customer. After fraud, once you've sold for fraud, the next big thing is, does John pay back his loans? If I give John a loan, does he pay them back? In the old days, what used to happen, if you go to some of the smaller towns in Kenya, you remember that the bank manager knew everyone and everyone knew the bank manager. The reason for that is that that was the willingness to repay check. Mr. Bank Manager would call you know, a vendor, you know, so-and-so has come for a loan of 10,000 shillings or 200,000 shillings. We can see from the bank statements that he's your customer or you're his vendor. Does he pay his, his, his bills on time? If the answer is yes, the loan would be given. If the answer was no, a tough conversation would be had. What's my point? My point is that today, 
we've got the thing called the Credit Reference Bureau, which is a central database that allows us to see your willingness to repay. And that's why it's important for people to take at least one loan in their adult life and repay it back so that there's a record of yours in the CRB that says you've paid back a loan at least once. The reason for that is very few lenders are willing to be the first person to give you that first loan. And it's important that you see that importance. So today, we are able to give loans for as little as 500 shillings. So I was telling a story. We're in 2011 now. Mshwari has figured that out. When Mshwari was launched, it made sense to me and many other ecosystem players because to do a fraud check, they already had all the subscribers. So it was very easy. They could, they could see this person has used this line for six months. Probability that the fraudulent is low. So it made sense to me. The ability to repay, they had M-Pesa. They could see that I had transactions of 100,000 shillings every month. They could see other people had transactions of up to a million shillings every month. So taking a risk, giving them 10,000 shillings didn't mean that much. It, you know, it made sense. And then, of course, they were able to do a, a, a guesstimation of willingness to repay. If I have 500,000 shillings flowing through my Mpesa statements, why don't I just give John these 5,000 shillings? If he repays, we'll recover the money from his... If he doesn't repay, sorry, we'll recover the money from the transaction fees over time. It's not that much. He moves a big volume. And if he doesn't repay, we now know he doesn't repay, but you could justify that first loan. Let's move over to 2012, 2013. And the Credit Reference Bureau is born. Regulations are issued by the central bank and we have the first iteration of the, 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 the CRB regulations. And in those days, only negative data was put into the Bureau. In fact, this has created another problem for us in the industry because over time, what has ended up happening is Kenyans know the CRB as a blacklist, whereas it has now evolved into a, a, basically a, 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 a list of your credit behavior. It just tracks how you manage your credit. So if you have 10 loans and you pay 10 loans every month, the Bureau knows you have 10 loans and you pay those 10 loans on time every month. If you have five loans and you pay two late and one a bit, you know, and you never paid one and you have three that you're paying on time, the Credit Bureau tracks all that data. So that's how the Credit Bureau began. In those days, the big challenge was, are we going to be able to populate the Credit Bureau Will, will banks use the credit bureau? Will SACOs use the credit bureau? Will microfinance banks use the credit bureau? And what ended up happening is we all, as lenders, saw the benefit of the credit bureau and allowed ourselves to submit and pull data. And then the magic started happening. In 2014, a company called Mukopo Rahisi launches the first smartphone app-based lending product. Now you're wondering why I think it's magical. Because I couldn't understand how they were doing fraud check. Because I said, I'm a lender, I've been lending for 17 years. I understood what Safaricom was doing. What I didn't understand is what is Mukopo Rahisi doing that we don't know. Because if you remember those days, Safaricom wasn't sharing data. And so they were obviously not doing any verification. They just gave the loan naked. The second thing is, how did they get transactional data? In those days, I didn't know you could scrape the smartphone and decide, you know, pick and pesa data from the SMSs, but it was a question, and they had figured it out, right? And then, of course, um, willingness to repay. At the time in 2014, Kamau just reminded me, there were 700,000 records on the credit bureau. And so my question was, how did they target customers? Because they must have found a way to know the 700,000 from the rest of the Kenyan ecosystem. And that was very mind-blowing to me. And in fact, two years later, I founded a digital lending company 
because of all the research we had done as a result of that question. I actually remember the day and where I was when I got that marketing SMS from Mokopo Rahisi. Because I was a lender and we were looking for growth in our business, when we got the SMS, we were like, this could be it. Because if we figured out how to lend 10,000 shillings to 100,000 people, would make a lot more money than what we were doing at the time. And if you remember, the interest rates were also quite, um, health, they were healthier. <laughs> we're now in 2017, and Microsave releases a report that states that 2.7 million Kenyans are negatively listed on the CRB. This again continues to confuse the Kenyan. Um, and at that time, the, the CRBs and the ecosystem try to start educating Kenyans that actually you've got positive data being reported into the CRB. It began in 2014, and you've got negative data being reported. Come 2018, and I think the best product that has ever been designed, I know we are all going to, a lot of people are going to um, disagree with me on this one, but Fuliza is launched. How many people use Fuliza? Be honest, I use Fuliza all the time. Right? Fuliza is easily the most profitable product um, in the digital financial services industry. Um, I'll give you just three statistics. They lend over a billion shillings a day. They charge about 1% for the loan. And after 90 days, only 2% of the loan book has not been repaid. So if you do your quick math, that tells you how profitable that product is. But then if you do your quick math, it also tells you how much volume is moving. Because that's about $3.6 billion, $3 billion being lent out every single year through one product. Now, what's happening on the regulatory space? Because we're coming now to where we are now, 2023. So before we get there, let me also speak about where we are in the regulatory space. In 2012, of course, CBK releases, 2013, CBK releases the CRB regulation. 2014, CBK releases the payment service provider licensing. This is the one that regulates M-Pesa and Airtel Money and all these mobile wallets. In fact, I think Devin is under this um, um, regulatory ambit, a cellulant. 2019, we have the Data Protection Act that enshrines data privacy into all digital businesses. Um, what's my point? My point is the policy makers, Pole, the policy makers were trying to solve this problem too. They realized that they too had to start being more innovative, more progressive, and try to manage the regulation so that it doesn't stifle innovation. And that's why we are where we are today. If you think about that evolution, I've just spoken about up to 2017. It's remarkable. Before 2017, 10 years before, the industry of digital financial services literally did not exist. It was zero. It had nothing. It had no one working for it. The only financial institutions at that point were banks and microfinance banks and Shylocks. Ten years later, you've got Fuliza doing a billion shillings a day, you've got Mshwari, you've got over 200 digital lenders, you've got about five payment service providers, you've got M-Pesa that has reached 60% penetration in country, and that remarkable growth is something we need to be very proud of as a country. So now we are in 2021, 2022, and I'm sure we all remember the, the famous campaign promises that were being made. Oh, there are 14 million people in the CRB. We're going to remove them, you know, bottom-up economy. 
Others were saying, you know, these um, lenders, they are too expensive, blah, blah, blah. But what that told me as a digital financial services player is we now have 14 million records on the Credit Reference Bureau. And because I knew that both positive and negative data was being submitted, that was a very good sign. So by 2020, Kenya was the fourth um, best data, I think it was, it was um, doing business report. We, had the f we were ranked fourth in the, in the world for data credit information sharing mechanisms. Fourth in the world, first in Africa. Then something happened in 2022, November. Hustler Fund. How many people have used Hustler Fund? Very few. I'm disappointed. Hustler Fund is a brilliant, brilliant product. Why? The Hustler Fund solves for a thing called the first loss risk. If you remember, I said that one of the biggest challenges in lending is that the first loan you have to give out is usually the riskiest because you don't know if this person is going to pay you back, right? Now, you've got the government giving you at least 500 shillings to demonstrate to everyone else that you pay back loans. And they're charging you 8% per annum. It's the cheapest money in the country. Even the government doesn't borrow at 8% per annum, right? So if you're genuinely in business, you should be using fully, um, hustler fund like crazy. I'm on my 10th hustler fund loan. I have saved over 550 shillings. My limit has moved from 950 to 1350 today, right? At some point, no, that's a big deal because I'm getting 1350 at 8%. Even government doesn't borrow at that rate. If I continue taking it and I get to a limit of 100,000 shillings, at some point I'll have access to 100,000 shillings at 8% per annum, right? And I will have savings that I can access at some point in my future. They say it's a pension, which I believe, by the way, and I hope that they, they keep their word, that I'll be able to access that savings at a later date, when I genuinely need savings because I'm an old, gray-haired man. So Hustler Fund was the next big thing. Hustler Fund will take financial inclusion to the next level because it basically solves for that bottom of the pyramid piece. Those people who would never have gotten loans now will be able to get loans. And if you think about the objective of capitalism, which is to get capital to those who need it. What the Hustler Fund has done is that it gives every hustler entrepreneur at least 500 shillings to start some game to make money. And that's a very important thing. And I know the argument is, oh, 500 shillings is too little, blah, blah, blah. We had to start somewhere. We are not Switzerland that has bucket loads of money. We had to start somewhere. And the example I like to give around Hustler Fund is in 1954, the U.S. started the Small Business Administration Fund, which is exactly like Hustler Fund, but in 1954. So none of the digital aspects of it, but had all the elements of trying to get the money to the bottom of the pyramid and to those entrepreneurs who had innovative ideas so that they could start building something. Today, let me shock you, that same fund was the fund that gave Apple their initial capital of $12,000. Today, Apple is worth almost $2 trillion. So just to make the point of we needed to start somewhere, 1954 to 2023, so we are many years, 70 years behind, but we are many centuries ahead of our peers, and it's, I know it's not good to, to compare ourselves with the bottom, but I think as a nation, we need to tap, basically pat ourselves on the back for how far we've reached around this issue of financial inclusion. So I guess the next point is, where are we going? 
What's the next frontier? What does the future of fintech, finance, DFS, digital financial services look like? And the answer is that you're going to get very highly personalized solutions and you're going to be getting financial services when you need them. It's called embedded finance. And today I want to give you a bit of a, um, a, a summary of a business that I work in to explain how embedded finance works and why and how sort of give you a glimpse into the future of finance. In the old days, if you wanted to set up a bank account, you basically walked into one of the 30, then there were more banks today, there are 38 banks, and you basically opened a bank account, you all filled in the same form. There was a question that would ask sometimes, which industry are you in? But if you worked in banking, you knew no one really looked at that. They're more interested in your deposit and your cash flow within that bank account. The company that I'm talking about is a company called Oye. And what Oye does is that it seeks to empower the Boda Boda rider, right? And the way it's done that is that it studied the Boda Boda rider for a whole year. There are two million Boda Boda riders, 2.347 bikes in the country. 80% of those bikes were financed, right? I hope we're together till there. 99% of riders are men. Is that surprising? Um, now, what are their biggest challenges? The first biggest challenge is that 36% of all road traffic accidents are Boda Boda related. I'm sure, you, if you go back to your villages, You've gone to the hospital, you've seen the ward that's for Boda Boda guys only. The interesting thing about the accidents these Boda Bodas have is they're not, they're not usually fatal. They break a leg, they break a toe, they break a thumb, they break a finger, they scratch, they get a cut, they need a stitch. And so usually the cost of the, hos the hospital cost is not as high as you think, right? What's the second problem we saw? 2.7% of Kenyans have any kind of medical or personal accident cover. That statistic always shocks me. But the real reason that is so is that the bottom of the pyramid doesn't, one, have the luxury to pay a premium for something that might not happen. And if it doesn't happen, they don't get a refund. So if you're at the bottom of the pyramid, that doesn't sound like a good deal, right? Why, why would I pay for something that might not happen? And then if it doesn't happen, I don't get my money back. And then if it does happen, I have this very painful process to get the benefits that were promised to me. And when I'm at the bottom of the pyramid, I already don't trust everyone else. And if you think... You don't trust the system. You've never met a Boda Boda rider. Boda Boda riders don't trust financial institutions. They don't trust um, anyone above them in the social hierarchy for whatever reason. And this is why we have created an antagonistic relationship with Boda Boda riders because we call them thieves. We call them bad riders. They drive badly. And the more and more you say that to them, I think we forget that they are hearing. And what ended up, what has ended up happening is that there's been a built up resentment over time against car owners, for example. So the same way you don't like them, the same way they don't like you, right? The other insight is that because there are many, I said there are how many? Two million. Everyone sees them as an opportunity. So there's always somebody trying to take advantage of that number of people for some good political. We see them being used in political rallies. If you want to sell a new item, you know, you go to the Boda Boda community first, blah, blah, blah. And so it's a completely low trust society. So that's the second problem we identified. And then, um, what, so what we decided to do 
is we decided to solve for the trust and we decided to solve for the insurance penetration and we decided to solve for the product that gives them some money. So what did we do? We studied them again and asked ourselves, what is this thing they do every single day that we can capture them and embed some kind of finance without having them to change their behavior? It seems obvious when I say it, but it wasn't obvious to us when we were doing research, but it's fuel. A Buddha Buddha rider needs to put 300 shillings worth of fuel to make at least 1,000 shillings a day. Right? That's sort of the ratio. So they have to fuel every day. And so what we did is we designed a product where if they fueled 90 liters at our partner petrol stations, they would get a free personal accident cover that gave them four main benefits. The first benefit solves the problem they have already, which is when they go to hospital, they need to make, they put money out, out of pocket. So we give them up to 10,000 shillings if they came with a receipt and a police abstract proving that they genuinely had an accident. The second thing we give them is a loss of income cover. A Boda Boda rider makes on average about 1,500 shillings a day. The lowest makes um, less than 200 shillings a day because the entry of a Boda Boda is you pay 15,000 shillings to get a bike. Then you have to pay 500 shillings a day for 365 days to buy the bike. So you, your first hurdle you have to jump is 500 shillings and then you start eating. Start paying your fuel, blah, blah, blah. So the, the lowest sort of Boda Boda's income net is about 200 shillings a day. And the highest, and this is going to blow your mind, can be up to 50,000 shillings a day. The top 1% of Boda Bodas make 20,000 shillings plus every single day. Right? What do they do? They move high value items, money, um, they're, they're tethered to specific businesses that are willing to pay that extra to make sure that the goods or service arrives on the other side on time or, and safely. So, What's my point? The future of finance looks like OYE, where the customer will be, we will, the, the financial service provider will be going to you where you are, providing the service to you without you changing your behavior, because the rider in OYE's case doesn't change anything. They get to the station, they fuel how they fuel, they pay in cash, they pay in M-Pesa, the only difference is they accumulate these points that are counted in an innovative way at the station, right? And that gives sort of a sense of the future of finance. It'll be women-led products. When you go, um, say, shopping, and I, I'm, I'm just choosing that because that's what came to mind, um, and Say you're, you know, you, 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 you're, say you're paying for school fees, right? And your child has some kind of um, ailment or allergy. And, you know, we the data service, pro we the digital financial service providers know that because we offer you some other kind of product. We can be able to embed some kind of insurance for a specific, you know, school, for a, you know, school type insurance into a product at the source of you paying school fees. Things like that are the future of finance. Now, I was asked to also talk about data, the Data Privacy Act, data, um, the Data Privacy Act 2019. Um, and the way I wanted to frame it is data privacy the fact that we have a Data Privacy Act means that we are living in a very modern society. Because what we're basically being told by policymakers is you collect customer data, they're called data subjects, and you must treat that data in a specific way or you suffer the consequences. Why is that a good thing? It's a good thing because data is the data is actually not supposed to be owned by the company. The data is your data. It's you who generates the data. The only difference is that we store it. So you must have some rights over that data. 
And this is what the Data Protection Act does. It creates these two categories of data processor. Um, and uh, what's the second one? I'm forgetting. Um, data processor and data controller, yes. And each of those types of data, um, those two categories have different functions and have to use your data in a very specific way. You as the data subject have very specific rights that you have. And so if, for example, you want your data deleted from a business, you can ask for that data to be deleted. The challenge with that is on the business side, we've never designed our systems to remove data of one client. And so what is happening now is we're trying to figure out best practice. So what we're doing at the association is we're working very closely with the Office of the Data Commissioner to ensure that we have a sort of a template data policy that data digital credit providers can use. We have um, a way to deal with this data from disabled people. We have a way to explain um, certain aspects of our contracts to people who don't speak English as their first language. Um, and many other things that cover the rights as a data subject. Um, if you have more questions, I'm happy to answer them in the Q&A session, but that sort of encompasses sort of the concept of the Data Privacy Act. We are still in infancy in the sense of the office was recently funded a year ago, um, and the, a year and a half ago, and the commissioner took over then. And this is when we're now starting to see um, the effects of that office. When's the last time any of you had anyone being dead shamed? It's been a long time, isn't it? If you really think about it. It used to be a lot of noise. Even when I entered today, um, Eunice, the first thing she said, you know, have you guys stopped shaming customers? But if you really think about it, the last time that happened, it has been a long time. Why? Because of the Data Protection Act and the Office of the Data Commissioner. Um, at this point, I'd like to say thank you um, and let the panel take over now. Asante sana.